Hello and welcome. I am Dr. Nicola Assiso and this is Aspen Talks Health. This is my first show and I'm so excited you're joining me because I am joined today with Stephanie Hirsch. She is the founder of Moms Wear Capes and we are talking today about confidence and how it's so important for your health and it's important in the bedroom. We're starting off juicy. Welcome, Stephanie. Hi, Nicola. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited that you're here. So tell me, please, tell me what, give, me, give us a background of your personal story and what led you to doing what you're doing now. In 2006, I started working with health companies and I was actually a ghostwriter. So I was writing bodybuilding, fitness training, cookbooks. Um, detoxification was a really big buzzword at the time. So I got really immersed in the health world. And I also was really lucky because I got involved at that point in my life with digital marketing or internet marketers in the direct response world. So I was selling all this great health stuff for a really huge audience, hundreds of thousands of people, um, which was extremely satisfying. But what I noticed was that every cookbook, every workout plan, every diet that we sold, it wasn't really changing people's problems. And mm -hmm. so what I learned after um, probably seven or eight years in that space was that in order to really get healthy, we have to be confident. True, very true. So. How did this all come around to Moms Wear Capes? Well, it's funny. I'm going to try to tie in the stories together. Please. What happened was when I first got pregnant, it was 2012, and I lost that child in the second trimester. Oh. Um, and I didn't necessarily want to be pregnant at the time, um, but my son's father, unfortunately, was diagnosed with leukemia, so we felt like we had a little bit of a, a ticking clock. So we eventually, after chemo and, and once he went into um, once he once he went into remission, we decided to try again. And this time, I was very present. I was more excited about being pregnant, and I recognized the miracle of what my body was doing and the miracle of of actually carrying it. You know, week after week after week, there was there was always this little like ghost behind me, like, are you going to lose it? And I think all moms who read these horrible pregnancy books are thinking the same thing. Can I carry this thing? Can I create this thing? Is it going to come out and talk and have eyes and have ears and think and be conscious, ideally? So what happened was during my pregnancy journey, I began to radiate confidence, so much so that my son's father said, I don't recognize who you are. Um, so sadly, we ended up splitting up right after my son was born, but my confidence was really extraordinarily transformed through pregnancy. Therefore, I decided to create Moms Wear Capes. And originally, um, Moms Wear Capes was a program to help mothers recognize that they are miracles as well as their children because a lot of times we focus on the kids and we don't focus on the moms. So Moms Wear Capes helps us take the attention to the nurturers because the women are raising the future of our world. Right, how beautiful. <sighs> how did all this confidence come about? Do, do you know the source? Like, what were you thinking? You know, like anything in life, it usually comes from pain. And I remember growing up thinking that my sisters were radiantly confident. They always got the guys, kept the guys, had the guys on their knees. Um, they, got, they had all the friends. They were the cheerleaders. And I was the bookworm. I was, I was always in the library. Um, and I, I was an athlete, but it was really a way for me to be an introvert and never participate in any social, uh, social or community experiences. I had horrific social anxiety probably until I was about 30 years old. And I, I, I wasn't comfortable in my skin. I wasn't comfortable in my sexuality because of a really fundamentalist religious community that I was in. I was, was one of these girls who like waited till marriage and didn't understand my body, didn't understand my sexuality, and then got thrust into marriage. And I was I was like, you know, I could have just been a nun. This wasn't really worth waiting for. <laughs> so what I ended up doing was 
once I had that pregnancy experience, realizing that I was creating another life and another soul was coming into this earth through my body, I felt like I was on top of the world. But when I got a divorce, I was absolutely destitute. At one point I was selling furniture just for groceries. And I knew that it was so beautiful that I was able to be a stay at home mom for a little while, but now I had to get my act together. Yeah. So it started with me faking it. I walked into uh, coffee shops. I walked into entrepreneurship communities or networking events uh, clubs or social events. And I just told people what I did. I'd never made a cent doing it. I didn't have a business card. I didn't have a plan. I didn't have a staff and I didn't have content, but I would walk up to people and say, hi, I'm Stephanie. I'm the founder of moms wear capes. What's moms wear capes? Well, we're a community of women who understand that in order to thrive as mothers, you need to thrive as women before trying to be a super mom. You have to be a super woman. And I just had this elevator pitch and I told everyone I knew that that's what I did. That was my, my job, my role. And I, and I owned something that I was manifesting. Love I it. hadn't created it yet, but I was confident that I was going to create it. And I knew that it was already done, that I was already receiving paychecks. And I was just living in the confidence and the realization of what the universe had put in my heart. I love that. It's interesting also when you're in the flow of service, how it all comes together so easily too. Yeah. But it does start with confidence because you need yeah. that confidence to get going. So how, how, what are some tr tricks or, or, or tips that you give moms to build up that confidence and start something that they're passionate about and they want to grow? Mm. So the ironic thing is we have realized the fullness of our femininity, we've experienced the full range of our emotions and our hormones. We've realized exactly how incredible the female body can be for women who have the opportunity to have children naturally. And that doesn't take away from the experience of adopting. Um, however, carrying a child, at one point you're thinking, I'm the most incredible person in the world. And then you have this child, you're so sleep deprived. Your body has made so many changes. And sexually, you're very, very different. It might be painful. Um, uh, breastfeeding for women who choose to do that completely destroys your sex drive. Now, at this point, I'm 30, what? Uh, 32 or 33 years old when my son was born. He's, he's three and a half now. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to fall prey to the mom bod. I'm not going to fall prey to the mom sexuality. Like I'd rather he get it somewhere else. And so when I had the opportunity, when my son was so itty bitty to become a single mom, I decided that I was going to be like a, like a teenager and I was going to take my raging hormones and I was just going to find um, my sexuality, whether it was by myself or with someone else. And so I was just dressing differently. I was working out differently. I was talking differently. I was approaching my friends, um, approaching, um, you know, potential partners differently. And I just started asking for what I wanted. And all I wanted was the experience of feeling loved. And I wanted to be seen for the beautiful, sexy, awesome woman I was. And it was, it, was, <laughs> it was amazing that the very experience that kills women's confidence, which I think is really directly linked to sleep deprivation, became my greatest source of confidence. And so the number one exercise I did to recapture that radiant feminine goddess within me was a really simple meditation. And every night for months, I would sit in bed and, and I, I kind of sleep like I'm a sarcophagus. And I was, you know, start at my feet and I would touch my feet and touch my toes. And I would thank God or source or energy or universe. I would thank him or her for my toes 
and then my the balls of my feet, my ankles, my legs, and now I'm getting to something I used to be really self-conscious about, my thighs, and I would touch them, and I would thank them mm -hmm. for carrying me up the mountains in Colorado, for helping me walk and hike with my son, and I would thank my mm -hmm. stomach for the different places it had been and the different shapes it had taken to take life. I didn't worry about any pooches, and I started to just massage and touch my whole body and just give gratitude for every inch of my body. Suddenly, I started looking in the mirror and where I used to see stretch marks and, you know, flab or pooches or sagging or cellulite. <laughs> cellulite. Oh God, I used to have oh. some incredible cellulite and, and, and thankfully through all my years in health, figured out how to, how to totally get rid of that. But, um, but yeah, just started looking in the mirror. I'd wake, I'd go to sleep thanking God for my body and everything it could do. Beautiful. And then I would wake up and look in the mirror and say, damn, you look good naked. You know? <laughs> lights spite, on and all. In spite of it all. Like, <laughs> even with the lights on. Nice. <laughs> good. So that was my first exercise that I used to do. Beautiful. Mm. So it's every night. Every night I did it for months until I could stand naked in front of anyone in, in a really big, <laughs> amazing, and you're gonna, you're, you think I'm gonna tell a sex story, which I'll be happy to do if you want, but this is not a sex story. This was an, an incredible experience. You know, women are not as harsh in front of men on themselves as they are in front of other women. And so for my confidence journey, a really powerful moment was a clothing swap that my girlfriends and I did in Aspen, uh, Austin, Texas. I go between Aspen and Austin right now in my life, so I always get them mixed up. And uh, we did this clothing swap with 30-something women. And the woman who ran the party, Lynn she said, all right, everyone, take your clothes off. This is not just a clothing swap. This is a goddess celebration. We all ripped our clothes off every shape and size and started trying on new clothes and stuff like that. And I just remember walking out of there thinking, I wasn't prepared to be naked in front of 30 people. And I felt okay. And that was when I knew that those meditations had really worked. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. All right, so what other, some, what other tips can you give? The next one is you? very simple. Okay. I paired some, um, um, a set of 10 mantras, which I've already um, created a graphic for your audience. Wonderful. I prepared 10 very simple one-line mantras, and I would repeat them. I would sit in front of my altar, and I had the mantras hanging up in front of my wall, and I would listen to a beautiful, two beautiful songs. And I would repeat those mantras. And I think the first one was, I am worthy of my desires. I am worthy of love. I am completely lovable. I am a great mom. I got here on the back of this woman. So that was me saying, it doesn't matter what you did on the, in the past. Who you are today is because of her. Yeah. So stop shaming the woman who made what might be perceived as mistakes. And for me, the biggest mistake that I was, was holding a lot of shame around was my divorce. I never wanted to be divorced. I never wanted to be a single mom. And I never wanted to spend a night away from my son. Yeah. So I repeated these little mantras every single day. I had them up by my desk. I, I had the altar right in front of my door. So every time I walked in or out of the house, I looked at them, I repeated them, and I still have them hanging up at my desk to this day. So nice. I've also heard about writing that it almost in lipstick or eyeliner on your mirror. I've seen so people see do that, every, yeah. Every time you look in the mirror, you... you and it helps to shift because sometimes you look in the mirror and you're not so nice. That's true. So you see instead, you see the reverse of whatever you know you're going to think. That's a really good idea. Like instead of I see cellulite, I see a perfect tush. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you do have a great tush. Thanks. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, and then uh, do you have any other tips? Yes. So a couple more. And I'm only going to share with you my absolute favorite ones. Okay. But the next one in this 
this really continues to thread my personal story and my personal confidence journey, I started to recognize victim behavior. Uh. What I have recognized in my years now of studying confidence and being a very devoted student of confidence was that when I blamed others for my life and my situations, when I didn't take personal responsibility, when I played victim, and then most importantly, when I was codependent, my confidence was gone because I I completely gave away my personal power. Okay. So if you just think about what can I do to really stand in my own personal power, it's to take responsibility for your life and everything in it. It doesn't mean that I'm not gonna look at my son. Last night, we're making these incredible cookies. I should have brought you some. And the whole kitchen starts to explode with smoke because um, a friend of mine had made a pizza earlier and there must have been some cheese or some oil. And I'm going, shit, <laughs> I'm cussing. I said it like two or three times and then my son, we get in the bathtub and, and he stubbed his little toe and he looks at me, he goes, shit. <laughs> oh. Oh. And I said, baby, I didn't say, mommy made a mistake. I owned what happened, I said, mommy said a word that we don't, we don't like to say, especially not at school. And so what I would like to do is have a redo. And so instead of saying, I make mistakes, I do things wrong, I like to take him back to the kitchen and do a redo. So we put, after I scrubbed this oven, we put the cookies back in and I said, okay, there's still a little bit of smoke. Oh my, <laughs> so we did a redo. Cute. And it's a different way of framing your experiences. So I took responsibility for the fact that I said a word that wasn't great, but then we just did a little redo and we thought of a better way we could do it next time. Because every day, your best gets better. So if you don't like what you did today, change it tomorrow. And that's where the personal responsibility comes in. You own your life. You choose every feeling you have. Nobody can make you feel anything. So I choose shame, anger, hate, or victimhood. Not anymore. Now I choose love and accepts, acceptance and non-judgmentalism and compassion. Right, beautiful. The next exercise that I love to do every single day is I love to visualize something that I want. So I have a huge goal here in the Roaring Fork Valley of building some sort of, of retreat center. And I know a lot of people have this dream, but, but I, I've always been really, really turned on by intentional communities. And I would love to run sort of a mind, body, spirit type retreat center. And I, I just keep getting these visions. And then I try to tell myself that it's unreasonable and it comes back. But the thing is, I need a lot of money to build it the way that I want to build it. So sometimes before I go into a meeting, before I go into a filming, before I go um, to, to speak on stage, I will visualize what I'm going to say. I'll visualize my pitch. I'll visualize the people's faces in front of me. And in fact, when I'm not feeling very confident, I have a confidence avatar and she's the one speaking and I see her face I see her smiles I see her eyes and suddenly I start to become that avatar and I know what she looks like I know what her body looks like um, and I, I see how radiant she is because of every other circumstance that she has. So visualizing what I'm going to say how I'm going to say it how I'm going to get a yes how I'm gonna ask for money, how much money I'm gonna ask for. When I'm doing my business coaching or when I take a contract for somebody, I think, okay, I'm not leaving without this amount of money. And sometimes because I visualized it, it's so effortless, I don't even remember what happened because I've been there before. I've lived there before and a lot of athletes mm. will do this for peak performance is they will visualize their win. They'll visualize um, you know, every stroke if they're a swimmer. So in the same way, we can go into life asking for what we want, whether it's money or sex or health or communication with someone and we can visualize that experience and then when we get there, You've been there before. You've already been it's there. It's easy. Yeah. So there was this comedian who's turned 
uh, coach, and he has a technique where you say, basically, you complete the sentence, 30 days ago, I decided to start Aspen Talks Health. And then, and you let your imagine, imagination go wild on how wonderful it turned out and how many followers and how many people I'm helping <laughs> and all of these incredible things that you can imagine it coming to fruition. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's like you've already lived it, you've already created it, because everything you see in life was once just an imagination or yeah. a thought. Mm -hmm. So it's a beautiful practice that mm -hmm. does really, it really does boost your confidence. Oh, unbelievably, yeah, it's, it's incredible. Great tip. So why do you think all this confidence is so important to your happiness and your health? I think confidence is the key to my happiness every single day because at the end of the day, People take an assessment and they say, I want this, I want that. Tomorrow I want this or I want that. Today I didn't get this or I didn't get that. And so when I'm confident, I feel like I am more powerfully manifesting my life. Whether it's going into a meeting and saying, I'm, you know, Stephanie, the founder of Moms Wear Capes. No one has to know that I just made that up. But continually, um, confidently looking someone in the eye, sitting up straight and saying, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is what I'm capable of. It really takes a lot of the, I want to use a bad word. <laughs> it's okay. Do it. It takes a lot of the mind fucking out of the equation. Okay. So instead of getting ourselves into this, this swivet where we're overthinking everything, when we have confidence, we say, this is what I want. I'm going to get it. I'm, I'm not questioning myself and you have no reason to question me either. So not only do we radiate this power, but we're also making others feel like they're safe with us. There was a study done about people in a job interview and one set in this study, they hunched over or they had like a defeated position and it lowered their cortisol and, and or it, it um, sorry, it lowered their testosterone and it increased cortisol, which is your stress reactive state. It also makes you gain weight. Um, the other group did a, a Wonder Woman or power pose for two minutes in front of the mirror before their job interview, or they simply sat up straight and looked someone in the eye during this interview. The interviewer had no idea that he was dealing with people with poor posture showing a hunched over low confidence pose or people who had been trained to have good posture, look you in the eye, shake your hand firmly, maybe do a power pose, no crossing, no touching your neck, but they, they were open yeah. and they got the job categorically every time because they instilled confidence from their own confidence they instilled confidence in that employer it's so true just assuming that position and mm -hmm. you automatically are like all right bring it yeah <laughs> you do it. you become more powerful and on a spiritual level yeah. you're receiving yeah from God or receiving from the universe. I like to always meditate with my hands wide and my arms wide because on a, on a, on a scientific level, we're increasing testosterone, we're increasing our own confidence, but on a spiritual level, it's receptivity to the gifts from the universe. Beautiful, I love that. All right, real quick, how can confidence help you in, with sexuality in the bedroom? <laughs> you know, I, I shared with you a few minutes ago that I, I didn't have confidence. I had social anxiety and I really, it's not that I didn't have confidence with my sexuality, but I'd never tried. And so I started small with that meditation where I just touched my body and gave gratitude for my body. And then I started asking people for what I want. So I, when I finally, about two years after I filed for divorce, got, got in, a, in a great relationship, I think 18 months after I got in a divorce, you know, I just, I, I was very, very open and honest with my partner. I said, look, when it comes to sexuality, yes, I've had a child, but I assure you, I am the level of a 13-year-old, okay? Never been kissed. 
And I want to feel feelings that I haven't felt in 17 years. I don't think I'd really been turned on sexually since I was a teenager, when I was in my mid-30s, almost 35. And so for me, number one, being honest with, with someone you trust. And then understanding what you like. I like my neck kissed, or one of my girlfriends likes the back of her arm touched. So starting really small, figuring out what you like, and then turning your brain off. And like I told you earlier, your mind will get in the way of your confidence. But for confidence in the bedroom, it's number one, realizing that your partner, if you're with the right partner, loves what they see, what they hear, what they taste, what they smell. They love it. They want to devour it. And if you're not with someone who wants it, get with the right person. Right. Absolutely. And so just receiving the love that's in front of you and then working with your partner to identify what you like. I love that. It's fun. <laughs> it's so true because when you're so much younger, it's funny, it always cracks me up when older men like 20 year olds because I wasn't anywhere near as confident in my 20s as I was 30. Mm -hmm. And then of course the sex gets much better when you're confident. Oh yeah. And yeah, you're not in your head worried about what you smell like and taste like and uh, you know, the whole list <laughs> yeah. and what you look like. Yeah, and so if you just it can instead just feel your radiance as a beautiful, sexy woman, yeah. what a difference it makes. Oh, unbelievable. It's so much more pleasurable. You have something to be excited about when you're looking at it as something you're receiving versus something which a lot of married people do for duty. Yeah. And that's where the codependence kills confidence. Well, on that note, we have to end. But thank you so much for joining me, Stephanie. I'm so grateful that you were my first first interview. And uh, thank you guys for tuning in. I'll see you on the next show.